Uh, we're going to talk about magnesium today. If you go away with the feeling that I'm anti-magnesium, you will have got the wrong message. I am anti too much magnesium. And you will find out why as we go through. Um, <clears throat> first comment I'm going to make, uh, anybody who tells you that their product is scientifically formulated is somebody I would run a mile from. Uh, there's very, very little science in the equine nutrition industry. There is bits on fiber and starch and protein and things like that. But when it comes to minerals and vitamins, quite frankly, there's not very much science that's worth, worth talking about. Um, so the stuff I'm going to show you that we've done, I don't regard as scientific. It's, uh, it's not rigorous enough. It hasn't got enough controls and whatever. But I still think it's useful information. What we're trying to do, most supplement companies like us are working around diet and <coughs> our, uh, our primary focus is on calcium and magnesium or uh, chelated calcium and magnesium. But we're trying to understand what the nutrients that we're primarily involved with actually do within the animal. And my criticism of nutritionists is they look at what the gut does and the uh, liver and the kidney, and they tend not to look at what the muscles are doing or the brain or whatever. In fact, I think the brain is probably the most neglected part of our horses. So we do that with, by talking a lot to customers. I'll come back to that. We, but we're very interested in what happens within the animal. And we're trying very hard to put the true science, which is, of course, nearly all on humans or mice or whatever, uh, into the horsey context. So that's what we're trying to do. Now, where do we get the information that I'm going to talk about today? Um, primarily, we're very passionate about being close to our customers. So we don't actually sell a huge amount of horse products through retailers. We sell the vast majority of it direct. That's slightly different here uh, because the distances are so huge. Um, and we now have retailers in most states. Um, but we still encourage people, whoever they bought it from, to uh, provide us with the information about their horse and its diet, feed it into our database. We're actually just uploading, uh, in the next few days, we'll put a, an Australian database on Dropbox that all our retailers and we can get into. Um, and that'll just add in to this 4,000 horses that we've, we've been following through our process for the last uh, few years. Um, on top of that, we, uh, we've done a number of blood trials on horses, and a uh, total of 33 horses, some of which, five of which were in Australia as part of a big head trial. Um, and there, uh, I'm not really going to talk about those particularly today. We do trials where we don't do blood tests. So I think blood tests have, have informed us a huge amount about what I'm going to tell you today. Um, but they're generally not necessary from the point of view of a diagnostic tool. The calcium tests are a waste of money. Uh, we simply can't measure the stuff we need to measure. Um, uh, the magnesium tests uh, might tell us something useful, but often don't. Um, We've done uh, an extensive review of the literature. I think that's really important. Uh, I tend, because I'm too lazy, I tend to look at textbooks. Uh, digging into scientific journals is a nightmare. Incredibly expensive if you don't have uh, university access, which we don't. So we tend to do all our literature work on, on textbooks. Um, and finally, we do have a few independent people. Jane Williams uh, works for uh, University of West of England. She's an epidemiologist. Her statistics would be a thousand times better than mine. Um, and she did a study uh, on, a, on a group of eventers, dressage horses, and um, uh, show jumpers, which was presented at the International Society of Recreation Science as a poster, and has got those guys very excited. Um, this is just me being selfish. Uh, this year, we won uh, the Federation of Small Business uh, um, Business Innovation of the Year uh, Award. Uh, Federation of Small Business goes up to 250 employees, which would comfortably cover every single nutrition, horse nutrition company in Britain. So, and we're a lot smaller than that. So we're quite proud of that. But the main thing we got it for was the way we leveraged that customer contact and customer feedback into teaching us about horses and the technology. OK. Now, most of you here are not allowed to answer this question. So those of you that weren't here this morning, 
Um, what's the answer to this question? Should horses be naturally spooky? Who would agree with that that wasn't here this morning? None of you. Gosh, the message gets out incredibly fast. Do you know, at Equitana, uh, on the month, what day of the week was it? A Thursday morning, we had about 200 in the audience, and about 198 put their hands up and said they agreed that horses should be nervous and spooky, which was great. You lot have let me down, but never mind. We can't get it all right, can we? OK. Um, this is why I don't agree with that. Um, I think all of us can recognise that those lions are not in hunting mode. They are going for a stroll in the park. The antelopes know they're not in hunting mode. The antelopes are looking at them, keeping a sensible eye on them in case they change. But they're not running away as if, as if their life was threatened, because it isn't. So, effectively what we're saying is that horses, antelope, those sorts of prey animals, humans in the bush if we're walking around, should be good at assessing risk. We shouldn't run away from a flapping leaf or a butterfly. We should be assessing the risks around us. And any horse that is nervous and spooky and stupid is not assessing its risks properly. So that leaves us to the question, if we sedate a horse, can we improve their ability to assess risk? I think that's a really simple question to answer. If you impair brain function, how can the horse's brain assess the environment it's in? And I think the problem we have with all sorts of calming supplements and calming nutrients is that we impair brain function, we get a sedated horse. People say to me, I don't want to sedate my horse, I just want you to take the edge off him. Okay? You want him sedated, right? So, what we're all about is, is not sedating horses, getting their brains working properly. When a horse's brain is working properly, it has no reason to think there is going to be a lion behind the flower pot or behind the wing of the show jump, right? Or under the whiteboards. After all, these horses have been around a dressage arena a thousand times and they've never been bitten by a lion. They've never seen a lion and yet they still wonder whether it's there or not. So clearly the something is not working properly. OK, so there's going to be a little bit of overlap with this morning stuff and, and, and some more, I think, really interesting stuff on magnesium here. So this is basically a summary of what we've been doing. Firstly, uh, I said we, do, we use uh, textbooks. Um, because our primary supplementation package is, is chelated calcium, when we started selling chelated calcium in the UK, there was a huge chorus from all the other supplement companies and feed companies saying, you can't possibly calm a horse with calcium. That's a stupid idea. Uh, so I particularly like this book's title, which you probably can't read. It's The Role of Calcium and Comparable Cations in Animal Behavior. So let's just say the role of calcium in animal behavior. Calcium has a huge impact on the way the brain functions and therefore on animal behavior. A little bit technical, you don't have to worry about this, um, but one of the things that's really um, uh, important, I guess, is that um, the way the comparable cations, and these are sodium and potassium, and please don't blame me for the fact that we call them sodium and potassium, and sensible people call them natrium and kalium, and therefore the letters actually make sense. Um, in, uh, the, there is a big gradient between the inside of a, a cell, and here we're talking about nerve cells, and the outside of a cell. And that gradient for sodium is there's 15 times more sodium outside the cell than inside the cell. For potassium, there's 30 times more potassium inside the cell than outside. And when a nerve impulse is fired or when a muscle cell is fired, those two flick over, swap places, and go back again. And that's how it's all initiated. Magnesium, the topic of today's talk, um, let me jump back a bit. The, the people that sell you magnesium calmers will tell you that calcium goes in and switch the cell on, and I'll talk about that, and that magnesium goes in and kicks, it back out, kicks the calcium out again. Um, you have to have control over the magnesium to do that, and what you'll see is there's basically as much magnesium inside the cell as outside the cell. If we increase the magnesium uh, in the diet, it goes up in the blood, it goes up in the fluids around the cells, it goes up in the fluids inside the cells. It is not well controlled and you'll, you'll get some cells which are two to one, maybe even three to one, so I'm exaggerating, but primarily magnesium is not very controllable. 
Uh, I won't even bother to ask this time. Uh, the calcium figure, 30,000 to one. Uh, so here again, we're, we're raising the question, is calcium important to behavior? Well, if we're investing in a 30,000 to one concentration gradient between the inside and the outside, yes, calcium's important. Calcium is desperately important. Okay, I'm going to tell you about some of the blood trials that we did. We started these uh, very late 2011, and the first mistake I made was to, uh, to believe what I read about uh, calcium and magnesium in the, in the veterinary literature and whatever. Um, because this is the magnesium bit, I'll ignore calcium for now. The excess magnesium in the diet is simply excreted. That's what you will read. That's what you will hear. I've got feed Excel reports that say this horse has 234% of the RDA for magnesium, but it doesn't matter, the excess is excreted. Can somebody tell me how magnesium calmers work if you put magnesium in and any excess is excreted, if you don't change anything? Well, we believed it, we were wrong. And to compare calcium and magnesium now, this was uh, total blood calcium because the magnesium's total. And you'll see that total blood calcium, these are all horses that have entered our trial. And by the way, we've only ever done trials on horses with difficult behavior. So all of these horses that you're going to see the blood tests of start with difficult behavior. And you can see total calcium is pretty well regulated, nice and tight um, in here, uh, fairly close to the center. Uh, great. Um, my friendly biochemist here. Oh, she's escaped. Anybody know the hormones that regulate calcium? No? You've probably heard of parathyroid hormone and maybe you've heard of vitamin D. Those are the two main ones. Uh, and that, that process is quite well understood. I say quite well understood. Um, it's not understood in real detail. <clears throat> when we give our chelated calcium supplements to uh, horses, their blood total calcium barely changes. But if you look at the same population of horses, there's actually more horses because we didn't do total blood calcium on our first trial and we should have done. These are all horses with magnesium uh, levels. And what you can see is clearly is far less controlled. We've got horses out the top, horses out the bottom, and a cluster in this area here. Now, bear in mind, all of those horses were badly behaved, every single one of them. So wherever your blood magnesium level is, is no guarantee that your horse is going to be well behaved. And I think that's a really fundamentally important issue. We gave these horses um, chelated calcium supplements because that is our interest. The first five of them also had magnesium in that supplement. Quite a lot of magnesium and quite a lot of chelated magnesium. Despite adding more magnesium, the tendency is that they come in together. Our conclusion from that is that in some way, which is a mystery to us, <coughs> chelated calcium helps the animal to regulate magnesium. But it's all not perfect because whilst this lot started to behave quite sensibly, these guys up here were still a problem. Even that one, the second one down, um, was still a major, major nightmare. Um, I can't remember why I put that in twice, so I'll ignore it. This is what we now regard as our ideal blood magnesium range. Now, I'm not suggesting that any of you actually do a blood test. I really don't think it's necessary to do that. Um, but clearly, if you did have, if you did do a test and it's up here somewhere, or even up here, uh, you're going to have difficult behavior. So effectively, what we're saying is, if you're outside this range, even with my wonderful chelated calcium, you're still going to have difficult behavior. These horses were still hard to ride. So we've developed a thing we call our magnesium factor, which tries to avoid taking blood tests because they're expensive and not as informative as you, as you would like. So if any of you buy a supplement from us, or at least our behavior supplements from us, the first thing we'll ask you is to write down in detail what you're feeding the horse. Um, in the UK, we've got almost every single feed on our database, which was hard work because there's hardly anybody puts their magnesium levels on their 
bags in the UK, whereas out here, I'm glad to say you do, and your websites are informative. So we will be building up a database, and we are using Feed Excel at the moment as a short circuit. So we will have a database, and you'll say I'm using so-and-so's supplement or so-and-so's feed, and I'm giving three dippers or whatever, and we'll be able to do a calculation. And the calculation has three elements to it. We have a different weighting for the magnesium that is naturally in the background of the feed. Uh, we have a different weighting for the magnesium that's added to feeds as magnesium oxide, which is the most common additive. And we have a third one for chelated sources of magnesium, which doesn't occur in very many feeds, but is pretty common in the supplements that are out there. Um, we then target, uh, we have a, a, an ideal magnesium factor which happens to be 0 0.8. It doesn't matter what that number is. And if yours is too low or too high, we'll discuss how we're going to get it to 0 0.8. Now, having a mag factor of 0 0.8 is also not a guarantee that the horse is going to be sensible, but probably 70 to 80% of horses with chelated calcium and that magnesium factor settle down. So there's still another 20 or 30 that we have to fiddle around with, and at that point it becomes uh, an educated guess with the emphasis on the word guess. And we'll put it up, we'll put it down, we'll ask you what the horse has responded to in the past. It's a very, very useful tool, and I guess uh, from my point of view, we get our right first time success rate is higher since we started doing this. Okay, uh, the horse that was the highest magnesium in, in our first blood test was Lucinda Green's horse, Cry Freedom. And we hadn't developed the mag factor then. But had we done so, he had a magnesium factor of 1.6, in other words, twice our ideal. Um, any of you probably don't follow Lucinda as far as her riding is concerned. Um, she uh, she has ne virtually never finished in the top half of a class riding Cry Freedom. Um, and, you know, she's quite a good rider, really. And. Uh, and, and this, was, this uh, mag factor was achieved feeding um, a Mars horse care product, a, Winergy, a couple of Winergy products, exactly as recommended, actually less than recommended. Lucinda's horses are out on grass 24-7. They've got lots of grass. If they are not wanting to eat supplemented feed when they come in, they don't. They're not hungry. So getting them to eat uh, even a high fiber diet like that one, particular one was is quite hard. So it was on. 1.6, maybe less. So you can see that's clearly way above our ideal range. So this was one of the horses that went on to a magnesium and chelated calcium. So, oh, before I do that, sorry. Um, this is the Feed Excel report that came with Cry Freedom. And you can't read it, I'm sure. 234% of the recommended level of magnesium in the diet. On a formulated feed, manufactured by the company that probably claims to have the best scientific resources in horse nutrition anywhere in the world. Um, and then this is a Feed Excel statement, I think, but clearly Mars Horse Care agrees with it. Excessive magnesium is excreted in the urine. So they obviously hadn't taken a blood test, had they? Because it simply isn't true. So we put it on our chelated calcium supplement with what we regarded as our standard magnesium level at that time, and that actually put the mag factor up to 2.4. But despite adding magnesium, the blood magnesium level dropped, which was quite exciting and interesting and reinforced that theory that somehow chelated calcium is helping to regulate uh, magnesium levels. But I have to say, um, it didn't make a lot of difference to the horse. If I was really desperate, I could say, yeah, he was better. I actually watched him jump a, sh a clear round. This is a horse that Lucinda has ridden, not every year, uh, others have had a bash at it, but um, for 11 years. And it's got two clear rounds, show jumping to its name, uh, which I don't think is very good. And I watched one of them, and it was the horriblest. We had a talk discussion about horriblest and horribler and earlier. It was the worst show jumping round I've seen in my life that didn't knock any poles down. Uh, it was seriously bad. So here is a horse that is track literally dragging a legendary event rider around show jumping courses and, uh, and uh, cross country courses. And he was still doing it. 
I should say, I should explain why we got Cry Freedom in our trial. Um, we've sponsored Harry Mead for a long time, and, uh, and, and Lucinda persuaded Harry to write Cry Freedom for about two months. And what we did was we stuck him on our supplement, we gave him loads of magnesium, because that's what we all thought was the right thing to do at the time. We didn't make any progress on him at all. Lucinda happened to buy uh, our allergy product for her dog, and I wrote her a letter, I sent the product, and I wrote her a letter saying, we're doing some blood tests, we tried your horse three years ago, didn't make any dent on it, do you want to put it in the trial? And she, being Lucinda, said, yeah, great, I'm really interested in that. Uh, so, that's where we were, and unfortunately, from my point of view, Lucinda was sponsored by um, Miles Horse Care, as it happens, um, and she continued to use their feed because it was free, which is a pretty good reason. Uh, eventually, she lost that sponsorship, and uh, what happened was we were able to take over the whole uh, the whole feeding of the horse completely, 100%, which was a bit out of our comfort zone. Um, you know, that's not really what we've been doing. Um, but we sorted it out and we played around and we fed it with a magnesium factor of 0 0.8. And that is where his blood magnesium was. Slap bang in the middle of our target range. What's more important from my point of view is the email that says, hey, we just finished fourth, and as you know, we have never been placed, ever, in 11 years. I've got another email that says, my horse has never looked so good, he's never felt so good, and he's never gone so well. And really, I know we did change quite a lot of things in the diet, but the, only, the, the protein and energy levels were not, not adjusted. The only thing that was changed in a major way was this magnesium level. So it's, it's nice to have, I know in a way it's an anecdote, it is not the only horse, the other horse on that original trial that had not quite such a high level also came down into the top end of the normal range, also remained difficult until we actually went completely cold turkey on that horse. Um, they, they took his, uh, all the magnesium supplemented feeds uh, out of his diet so he was just getting a really plain diet. In four days, that horse just went <sighs> and then went to a competition, did its uh, best ever dressage test. Um, according to the rider, it had a couple of fences down, but the rider said it was the best show jumping. She wasn't being dragged around um, and was going beautifully around the cross country, had got through the water jump, which was its big bogey fence, and then it snapped a tendon explosively and was put down before I could get a blood sample out of it. But it was very sad, owned by a, re a young girl, about 20 year old, it's very sad indeed. Okay, so magnesium, good and bad. So I do want to emphasize that magnesium is important. It does have good things about it. The two main ones are energy provision for the brain. Um, all of our cells work with an energy uh, molecule called ATP, and you can't make ATP unless you've got uh, an enzyme called ATP. ATPase has magnesium in it. And if there's not enough magnesium, one of the reasons we believe that horses can be difficult with inadequate magnesium is that they're not providing enough energy for the brain to function properly. The next one's a little bit technical. Um, nerve cells send messages to each other as a chemical called a neurotransmitter. Uh, one of the common ones is a neurotransmitter called glutamate, and uh, some nerve cells have glutamate receptors. Magnesium is also involved in the function of glutamate receptors, but it doesn't control them. It's like a door there. Something else comes along and takes the magnesium and throws it out. So it's not a controlling function, but um, we believe, and this is getting very speculative, I have to say, that if there's not enough magnesium, there are glutamate receptors that are open when they shouldn't be, because there's not enough magnesium to block them. And it's possible that when there's too much magnesium, the glutamate receptors are supposed to kick the magnesium out with so much magnesium around they can't. Now, as I say, that is entirely speculative. The main reason I've got that up there is because I have a lovely email from the senior lecturer at the Royal Agricultural University, which said, I've spoken to a lot of equine nutritionists in my time. Uh, you're the first one that's mentioned glutamate receptors to me. So we're in a situation where we are trying to read, in this case, a neuroscience textbook and make sense of what's going on. 
And the reality is that the people with much bigger resources than ours aren't, which is, I think, a little bit sad. So, very briefly, this is my illustration of a nerve cell, a very oversimplified one. Calcium-rich fluids outside, uh, virtually calcium-free zone inside. When we want to start a nerve cell, um, inside there are calcium receptors. We put a little puff of calcium in. We all do this, and it finds the calcium receptors, sits on it, and switches it on, switches them on. So this is called calcium cellular signaling. It is an incredibly common technology developed by nature, I don't know, eight billion years ago, something like that. Um, it occurs in plants, it occurs in bacteria, it occurs in animals. It's, it's very ubiquitous. Most of the cells in our body are switched on and off, or part, things in our cells are switched on and off by calcium signaling. It's really important to understand that there is no role in this for magnesium. So the idea that calcium goes in and switches it on and magnesium follows it and switches it off is simply not supported by the billions of dollars of research that have been spent on studying calcium cellular signaling. So it was a great hypothesis in 1970, maybe 1980. It simply turned out not to be right. And when you see those control figures, we're not controlling magnesium. We're clearly controlling calcium to that 30,000 to 1. Why would you use something you can't control to control something you can? It simply doesn't make sense. This is what magnesium does, though, when you get too much of it. Um, because it's very closely related to calcium, it will find these receptors and it'll sit on them. <coughs> And this is like you walking into the, into the room, you want to switch the light on, but a member of the local rugby club standing in front of it won't let you get to it. You'll eventually elbow him out of the way and switch it on, but the cell's clearly not functioning properly and it's an obstacle to, uh, to doing it properly. So this is how magnesium sedates horses. And I use that word sedate very intentionally. You probably can't read this, this is a scientific journal, the effect of magnesium sulfate on the total anesthetic and analgesic requirements in neurosurgery. I am told there is a time when equine vets used as their sole anesthetic on horses magnesium sulfate. And this is what they're doing, uh, switching the cells off by not allowing the calcium to switch it on. Um, in, human, uh, in human anesthesia now, we still use magnesium sulfate, and this is a paper on it. Uh, we tend to use two things together. I understand calcium channel blockers, so we're stopping the calcium puffing in in the first place. But as an insurance policy, we're making sure the inside of the cell is flooded with magnesium so that any that get through still don't function properly. This is the reason that the FEI regards injectable magnesium sulfate as a controlled medication controlled in that you're allowed to use it on horses. It has a function and a purpose to use in horses, but you can't use it in competition. Um, and that would apply to any other similar magnesium compound. So magnesium chloride would be banned if you injected it for the wrong reason. And just to highlight, definition, sedative. It is a sedative. So the question then is, we've talked about magnesium and what it might do for the good, how much magnesium is bad? I'm going to illustrate this uh, with one horse and refer to our magnesium factors. Um, this is a guy called Harry Mead. Uh, his father's got more gold medals eventing than anybody else in Britain, still, even though he's 70-something. Um, Harry has probably completed more badmintons than anybody else of his age. He's 31, I think, this year. And uh, he's on the world-class program, and that means he gets advice from, free advice, from a world-class nutritionist. He gets advice from us, and he has a, sometimes a conflict of interest. And uh, back in 2013, so two years ago, uh, the world-class nutritionist won, I guess because we didn't jump up and down shout enough. Um, and his horse had a magnesium factor of 1.6. So as it happens, exactly the same as Lucinda's horse in the blood test. Um, Harry is coached by Laura Bechtelsheimer, who's a very good friend of his, and, uh, and their dressage result was, let's say, disappointing. There are about 85 horses in badminton. Um, and before he was even a customer of ours, he used to finish 57th. 
Um, so 77th was pretty awful. Now this horse was on our chelated calcium supplement with no added magnesium in it, but a load of magnesium in the feed that he was using. Um, so not a very good result. This year we won the argument and because that was such a disaster, I mean that, that was horrible. So this year he had a mag factor of 0 0.8 and they were 47th at the end of dressage. Uh, that's Harry's worst ever dressage result at any four star. That's his best ever dressage result at any four star. So 46th or so out of 85 may not be spectacular but for Harry that's pretty damn good. The cross country phase on mag factor 1.6 there were 30 horses went round better, faster. Didn't have any refusals, no, no problems like that. Harry is one of the best uh, event riders certainly in Britain, uh, cross country riders rather in Britain. Um, so to have 30 horses go around a cross country course better than him was pretty awful. This year five horses went around faster than him. And so again the performance in that phase was dramatically improved. And the show jumping, which in many ways is the real test of whether a horse's brain's working properly. If I want to go and look for prospective customers, it's the show jumping I will go to. Because horses tend to get stronger and flatter if they're not fully in control. And that happens with four star horses as it does with any other level. So back in 2013, 18 horses show jump better. I think he had three fences down. Uh, this year he had one fence down, there was only one clear round show jumping at badminton this year. So we've got a situation where the magnesium level being reduced as the only major change got him from his worst four star result ever to his best four star result ever. Now I have to admit I don't claim all the credit for that, this year's badminton was an event where it was quite heavy going on the cross country. It became a real test of cross country. Alf, as a horse, is a pretty damn good cross country horse. Harry is an exceptionally good cross country rider. So I'm not claiming all the credit for that, but we've delivered to Harry a horse that could uh, achieve much, much more. Now, it's tragic news day today, isn't it? Because some of you will know that Alf dropped dead at the end of the cross-country course at WEG this year with a suspected heart attack. So that's another horse that <laughs> we've been working with that, um, that sadly is no longer with us. Just going to finish off with a few little testimonials really and I'm just highlighting this one. Young girl, um, B100 is pre-novice. Um, and she just said, we decided to try Walt on Mag Free, Cool Calm and Collected, and Walt's behavior improved. But then she got more advice and we tweaked the magnesium levels and it's helped even further. So this just highlights that our fine tuning program is a useful thing. Don't just buy a product from us. Start where we suggest you start and wash your hands of it. Um, magnesium's a real moving target. Your pasture will change day in, day out if it rains, if it doesn't rain. Um, sometimes whether the feeds you buy are as precisely controlled as you would like to think they are. So, so it is a moving target. This is Laura Tomlinson or Laura Bechtelsheimer as she was when she got Team Gold and Individual Bronze. Um, and she's making the point here that we managed to calm her horse down without increasing the magnesium levels. Now this is quite an interesting story behind this. So I said Laura's a very good friend of Harry's. Um, Harry is the world's worst salesman. To actually recommend something is, is, is something he really struggles to do. Um, but we met Laura at his Christmas party and uh, that gave us a chance to go and have a chat to him. Now the Bechtelsheimers are the reverse of a typical British group of people. The British are incredibly conservative, they don't like changing anything. If they weren't taught it by their grandfather's grandfather, they're incredibly skeptical about it. Um, the Germans are much, much more open-minded, particularly to alternative things. They're heavily into herbal things and whatever. So we went, to, we went to Laura and her father, who I have to say is the real driving force in that family, and said, look, uh, you went to Olympia just before Christmas and you won the competition on one night, but actually if you're honest with yourself, 
Vallegro made a bit of a pratt of himself and really Vallegro lost that night. And the next night, Vallegro did fine and Alf made a pratt of himself. So neither of you really won your competitions, the other one lost them. And I can't make Alf go any better. I mean, he's already, you know, he's already one of the very best, best Irish horses in the world. I'm not going to make him his best better, but I'm going to stop him throwing competitions away. And that was what got them to give it a go. They then went to their German kinesiologist bloke who said, oh, yeah, actually, there's a bit in this calcium stuff. You know, we never noticed that before. So they put him on our supplement. What I didn't know was they took another piece of advice of ours at the time, and that was to reduce the magnesium level. What they had traditionally done was had all their horses on a certain magnesium level at home, but 10 days before they went to a competition, they put them on the show mix, and the show mix had more magnesium in it. And they'd just been doing this for donkey's years. And Alf only ever played up away from home. He never played up at home. So, so I only found that out early this year. But for the Olympics, he went with cool karma collected inside him and less magnesium than ever before. What I found really interesting watching Laura at the Olympics, and I'm not a great dressage expert, I have to say, but the first two rounds were the team competition, and I thought she rode him quite conservatively. She wasn't really very positive. He made a couple of silly mistakes, and I think they finished second, seventh rather, in both of those competitions. Um, and I must admit, watching it, I found it a little bit frustrating because we were confident we changed the horse and really she needed to be more positive and put her leg on and be more demanding. And Harry made the comment, who was actually there watching it, that he sort of felt the same thing. But more importantly, those two tests were the first two tests he had ever watched Alf and Laura do in which at some stage Alf was not bracing or Laura was not bracing against Alf. So she didn't actually have to force him into outlines and whatever. He was softer and more subtle and whatever. So that was a step forward. When it came to the individuals, um, she rode him completely differently. Now, whether that was not under team pressure anymore or whatever, she was really positive. She went out there. She demanded everything from him. He, he did an almost fault-free test, and she gets a bronze medal. So I have no doubt that all of, or most of you will experience that if you change your horse's brain function, you will have to change the way you ride it. And that's not necessarily easy, because if it's difficult for somebody with Olympic medals, then it's difficult for all of us. But horses will be able to be ridden much more positively. Um, I'm going to tell you this story, and this really is, we, we've got a video which talks about magnesium and does it in 22 minutes instead of 45, so it's still a reasonably long uh, video, but um, John Toomey's a four-star event rider in Sydney, and uh, he, we went to see him a year ago, and we did some video interviews, and his main problem was that his four-star horse would uh, do a, go out for a hack, and when he got to the far end and turned round, had no understanding why he shouldn't go home at 100 miles an hour. And so John, four-star rider, he's been in ditches, he's been in bushes, he's been, he's been everywhere. And he put the horse on uh, Cool Calm and Collected and suddenly um, he had much more control. I won't say the horse didn't want to come home a bit faster, but suddenly everything was fine. So John was really, really excited about that. But he told a story about his experience the year before he went to use Cool Calm and Collected. And he'd got his horse highly recommended, and he did what some people had told him to do with magnesium. And some people had told him not to do it. Um, but he did it anyway. And what he did was he fed a double loading dose of a well-known chelated calcium magnesium supplement. He stood the horse in water baths full of magnesium sulfate so that he could, they could absorb it through the feet. And he sprayed magnesium onto the skin. And in John's words, he had magnesium coming out of every pore in his body. He went into the dressage test, and John describes this test as very rideable. Now, this is a horse that would normally go in at A and explode. So it didn't go in at A and explode. This is wonderful. But he'd ask it to do something, and three or four paces later, maybe it would do it. Um, he talks about going down the center line, just wanting to collect him up, tiny little half full, full stops, just 
stops. Um, so yes, he didn't make a complete and utter idiot of himself. He probably got what one of his best dressage scores, but it was not. Well, John's words were, "I was not riding in the competition the horse that I rode at home," and I think that's really telling. How can you train yourself when your horse is going to behave completely differently when you put him into a uh, the wrong environment? So um, that was the first part of the story. But then what happened was there was going to be a bounce into the water, and he didn't feel that this horse had, uh, had experience of bouncing in the water. So he took him out for some cross-country schooling. schooling. He could not get him over a 90-centimeter fence. Now, John made the right decision. He shoved him on the lorry and drove back to Sydney. So that was John's four-star adventure in, in South Australia. Um, uh, a dressage test in which he basically described it as riding a drunk or a drug addict and didn't even go cross country. So I think it's a very powerful example of what I have to say is a truly extreme level of magnesium in the blood. That is not what we see in most horses. In most horses what we see is a horse that is very chilled out when it's not under pressure. So you've given it a magnesium karma and it's calmed it and you know it's calmed it and you go, yes, this is great, just what I want. And then you take it out and you put it under pressure. You might ask it to go sideways or you might put it in a hack and there might be sheep or pigs or whatever around. Um, when you put these horses under pressure, you've impaired their brain function quite intentionally and hey presto, they can't work out what is going on around them. And what happens? They explode. So it is incredibly common that people use magnesium karmas and actually get more explosive horses. It is very frequent that people say, my horse went loopy on such and such a magnesium karma. So there are people that have learned to manage that, and I'm sure there are some that do pretty well managing sedated horses, and there are going to be some horses you can get away with that with, and there are some horses that aren't. But it is a, a big warning that, oh, I should say, the, the other bit about that process is that when you know the karma worked when not under pressure and then it fails, you don't blame the karma. The karma worked, so you give it more. And we see people that go up and up and up the scale and then people that say, oh, you know, magnesium karma worked to start with and now it doesn't work at all anymore or whatever. So we see a whole spectrum of, of disappointments with magnesium karmas. So, we talked about our blood trials, and I think those blood trials have been very useful. I think it's unlikely that uh, a blood test on a horse is going to be required. Um, but we certainly believe, we, we believe we can get into this range and, and find out the horse in that range just by fiddling with the diet, fine tuning the diet for that particular horse. Um, and that's the process we would encourage you to go through, and we're here to hold your hand when you do it. And that's useless because that was only true at Equitana. Um, so, anybody got any questions? Yes? The length of time that they would um, change the diet to take out the magnesium properly for you to see. Good question. Because as some of you will know, when we're loading chelated calcium, we give it a month. Uh, magnesium, because it is very poorly controlled, uh, adjusts very quickly. So, um, that the ho this horse here went from there to there in about four days. Uh, and literally we took every magnesium containing feed out of his diet um, and it crashed. So what we often do now is if, if we've started at the level we want to start at, uh, we used to tinker with it if people weren't quite happy. But now very often we'll say, no, let's cut all the magnesium out of the system because in somewhere between four and seven days, it's gonna come down in the blood and you may see the horse get better and then it may start deteriorating again and you know that somewhere between those two extremes is where he needs to be. So it's quite informative and I think equally there are some horses for whom any amount of supplementing magnesium is a problem and we were missing them because we were mucking around up here. So now we test that level and that level and we only ever go up if we've got a very good reason to go up. We do go up occasionally but not far. Uh, that, yes, that is a very good question. I told you that we, we, have, uh, we, we look at the naturally occurring 
magnesium uh, and, the, and the mag oxide and the chelates. Um, what I didn't tell you was that the, the weighting that we give the natural pasture and even the natural feed background in a pellet or a muesli mix is zero, which actually means I ignore it in most cases. They are getting magnesium from there. Um, and in fact, if you do a feed Excel report on the vast majority of horse diets, you will find they are already getting the RDA with no supplementary magnesium whatsoever. So that amount of magnesium is, is, is naturally occurring in grasses and hays and those sorts, of, those sorts of things. So I put it as a zero because, um, because that's naturally there and it just seems to work for us. We have, we have put a, an allocation to it and it doesn't really work. There, there is one big exception to that, and that's copra. Okay, copra has four grams per kilogram of magnesium in it, and, I, and your grass is probably 1.4. Um, and we have had horses where we've sorted them all out on, a whole yard of horses that we've sorted out, got them behaving beautifully, um, and then the, uh, the owner has suddenly put them all on copra. And within two to six weeks, every single one of those horses went do lally. And we didn't take the copra out, we took the magnesium out that we had been putting in our supplement. So we'd been adjusting the magnesium. So it wasn't the copra per se that was doing the problem, it was the the total amount of magnesium. So I'm not anti copra. Um, so does that answer your question, I think? Yes, they would. Um, yes. Every, every one of the horses that we've, that we've blood tested was in work. They did vary from, um, uh, from let's say, novice eventers up to three-star eventers. Um, so, and, and some of them were dressage horses at working at, say, advanced medium or pre-Saint George, something like that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. In in the end, you know, you can do all sorts of proxies for behaviour, you know, and the and the scientists do muck around with uh, novel object tests and whatevers, and and they certainly have a place. I have no problem with that. But in the end, it is the rider's opinion that is what matters to me, and I think although that is subjective. If we haven't satisfied the rider, we haven't sorted it out. So we are trying to deal with two sentient beings, really, a horse and a rider, and both of them will have different objectives. And I'm sure there are some people that l love magnesium karmas, for example, because they're perfectly happy riding a sedated horse, and that's, that's fine. I'm, you know, if that works for somebody, that's fine.